Is it better to have a real but battered savior as imagined by da Vinci himself, or a fully restored facsimile, an inadvertent caricature? I gather people were horrified at the damage to the product, which would drive down its market value. But to my eye, it looked better for the battle scars and was more suitably resurrected for our own time. It had grunge, tension, scratches, scrapes, and it was stressed by random wear and tear. And yet it survived. Enough was preserved that it looked back at us and had a distinctive spiritual aura about it. You could say it was alive. But the well-intentioned, expert, and heroic job of restoring the painting, which took over six years, finally expunged the ghostly visage of the real Salvatore Mundi, steamrolling a cracked and broken painting into posh, Leonardo-esque wallpaper. What we have instead is a death mask, delicately realized through thousands of hours of the most careful and grueling retouching. Where there were great fractures of missing paint, our diligent restorer had to reinvent what must have been there, taking clues from more prominent hints at what must have been the artist's original marks or intention. It is an inevitable interpretation, physically realized by an art historian. Any other restorer would have come up with a slightly different result, and another new and alternate identity would be formed. But none of them would have the authentic presence of Leonardo Salvatore Mundi. I fear that the underlying motivation behind the project of restoring the painting might have been far less about preserving Leonardo's vision, or at least that of his workshop, but rather to assemble a hot ticket item for auctioning to the highest bidder. The result is a new and shiny cream puff Christ. So if you want the Christ, yes, the great Jesus Christ, prove to me that you're no fool. Walk across my swimming pool. If you do that for me, then I'll let you go free. Come on, King of the Jews. My worst fears aside, I don't mean to criticize the workmanship of the restorer nor impugn her motives. I trust that she applied the highest traditional standard and was as careful as possible not to alter the original image. I seriously doubt any other restorer could have done a better job. The problem was that she was tasked with achieving the impossible. It's one thing to clean and preserve a painting, but restorers are tasked beyond their capacity when they are required to retouch and even recreate severely damaged or missing passages. The restorer is not to blame when they are served a recipe for failure. One inherent and insurmountable problem for the restorer is that the finer details of the painting have been lost. The Mona Lisa, for example, once had eyebrows and eyelashes. They slowly evaporated in multiple restorations throughout the centuries. It's safe to assume Leonardo also gave his Salvatore Mundi developed lashes and brows, as that was typical of his established style. In fact, da Vinci had his own technique for constructing facial features, and most of his portraits share the same fundamental underlying eyes, nose, and mouth. But the restorer was obligated to treat the Salvatore Mundi as if he were born without lashes and brows, and if his nose through whatever happenstance, ended up crooked and wishy-washy, she had no choice but to accentuate that impression. This is the reason the whole face looks fudged, as if it were painted by an amateur. It's a repainting from a compromised state that had to use the deceptively degraded image as the definitive template. The infinitely delicate process of articulating misleadingly ghostly imagery creates seemingly haphazard approximations of anatomy. The Christ ends up with features that are only passably persuasive, as long as you don't look too carefully.
Tell you what, dang old dumb diddly. Talk about you gon' psychedelic sci-fi Mona Lisa robot people. No living in what you gonna do about Leonardo. While Leonardo's portraits have a very definite and deliberate underlying geometry, this painting looks mushy. We can even see some instances where the restorer changed the original painting from what could clearly be seen with the naked eye. The most conspicuous problem is in the fabric that crosses the chest. On the original version, the lower band clearly continues under the top band. There are three lines of this raised pattern that are clearly visible. And you can see that the band continues. And there's pattern here and along here and here. And it clearly goes through. But in the revised version, this is all gone. Now the underlying fabric seems to peek over the band, but intersects mysteriously where the bands transverse. If there are these kinds of changes to the fabric alone, what kind of changes are there to the face? There's a bigger problem with the eye. Even in the original, we can't see where the lids meet. We can see this lid here, and then this, it should come around and intersect, but it doesn't. And that is simply because of the aging of the painting, and the wear and tear, and what we just can and can't see. Leonardo does not make eyes where the lids don't meet, and yet the restorer has emphasized this very problem. So you have not only this issue, of lids that never meet. But the shape of the eye is bizarre. Why is it coming all the way down here? It's very odd. In the original, it can't clearly be seen. This raised area is probably not the bottom of the lid. This is right here. That makes more sense for the shape of the eye. But again, the restorer went with this lower, more conspicuous part, which has everything to do with age and wear and tear on the painting, and nothing to do with Leonardo's original intent or human anatomy. If we assume this painting really is by Leonardo, the way to go about realizing what it would really look like would include, first off, to figure out where the center point is on the face. And this one has no center point. The nose goes off this direction, the mouth goes off this direction, this eye's up here, that eye's looking over there. But this one does have a center point. And so I tried to find it using some guides in Photoshop, and I was able to do so. The center of the nose is here, not over here. And then next, I could establish, once I had the center point, I could establish equidistant areas so, for example, the nose, where the sides are going to be, left and right. The pupils, one should line up here, one should line up here. Outer parts of the eyes, where the inner part of the eye is. And it more or less lines up. You just can't be fooled by things that look like part of the eyelid, like this line here, but are not. And you can see the shape of the eye is a little debatable. Is this the lower part of the iris or is it down here? We should assume that they're going to match. So next I use the symmetry feature in Photoshop so I could paint on one side and it would paint on the other and I switched back and forth wherever there was a stronger indication. And here you can see everything can line up. The eyes are the trickiest, but they do basically line up. And none of that is apparent in this one. So, for example, if you look at the nose, you can see her nose comes all the way over here and down here. Well, that's not the nose. What that really is, is a shadow. 
she's interpreted the shadow as being part of the nose. And we know it's the shadow because if we look at it, we can see very clearly on the hand that the light is coming from the upper left. And this is why on the face, the neck is darker here and on this side of the jaw because it's in deeper shadow. So the eye is darker here than on this side and here and this part of the nose is dark. So it's hidden a bit in shadow. It doesn't mean that the nose actually um, grows out to this side. So you can see how I've articulated the nose, it makes sense. And the mouth also doesn't seem wonky and weird like it does here, like it's, I don't know, pushed in. It just seems weak, but that's not necessarily the case. And we can also see the eye, this one, the lids do meet, more or less. Where here, there's the illusion that they just go off parallel to each other for infinity. So we can match this eye to this eye to get a general idea where everything should be. This is also the problem she had with the jaws in hers. Oh, yikes. This jaw comes out way out here, jets out here, and this one comes in. And this cheekbone is stronger and comes down here, but this one is up here. None of that. It's just shadow. They actually line up fine. So the next thing I'm going to try to do, we'll see if I can succeed at it, is uh, paint in the features using these general guides to see what the face would really look like, more or less. And now, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time for our main event of the evening. I've traveled all the way from Mars to see the new Salvador Mundi with my own eyes. All right, here I am in Photoshop, and in order to try and recreate what Leonardo might have intended, there's a lot of stages to this, actually, might have got in over my head. But the first one is I've got to clean it up. This is what I've done so far. One more time, we can compare. And I'm using four techniques to do this, and I thought I'd just show you how it's done so you don't think it's too easy. These are the changes I've made so far. So one of the techniques I use is the clone tool. Uh, you just select a place by holding Alt and then you can clone over an area. Now another tool that's really handy is the spot removal. For that you just go over an area where there's a spot and Photoshop will interpret it out. So this can make things look easy but there's this big ugly piece here well, it's actually kind of beautiful in its way, but let's say I want to get rid of this. First, I want to make a discrete island, so I'll clone to get rid of the continuousness, the continuity of this streak. When it's isolated, I can just spot remove that whole piece. Those are the easy techniques. Then the other one I use, this is where we start getting more technical, is the brush. The one I like is this Terp Scrub. This seems to work the best. I had tried out a bunch of them. So let's say someplace like here, I'm going to get in and just paint it. You can hear me scrubbing away on the... Uh, you know, I've just got to get in there, a little trial and error. Grabbing different colors and kind of mixing them on the fly. So you get in there and you paint it. And something to know about these patterns is that it, because it's 
kind of an embroidery. It will alternate. This one will go on top, and then this one goes under, so you know that this one goes on top, and you can add a little highlight there. This one is under, so this one, take the brighter color, highlight it on top, and then we know that this is going to get some shadow. And later I can go in and use like this streaky blender and go in and kind of blend it a bit to make it less rough where I've painted it in. So that's another technique to use. So this is a, a quite a strenuous process. I've used it to, with some success, you can see, in this area, this whole thing, I painted out. Now this pattern was a little wonky to begin with, so I pretty much kept it that way because I'm not trying to change it. I also uh, managed to fix this area, all this stuff. And the other technique is to use a super soft spray. Uh, so something like this, I can pick a color, just go over it lightly. It needs to be bigger. So sometimes you get rid of that little plume and get it in there and softly articulate things like the nose. This is going to be one where, you know, down here, you can just softly go in. So those are the techniques I'm using. It's going to get pretty iffy in here, the nose, around the nostril, but and I did do some of the mouth already, which was pretty tricky, but I didn't without changing it. Now you can see our restorer's version, it's already different. Look at that. And there's things like in here, oops, where I will try to go in and create the pattern that's missing. And what she did, probably because it's all she's allowed to do, is she put in the pattern that's already there and just made this other area kind of fudgy and blank, which looks not so good in this area. I mean, it's actually fairly distinct here. So I'll, I'll try and figure out what the pattern is and go in and articulate it so it looks pretty good. Anyway, so that's where I'm at now, so you can see just how much work it's gonna <laughs> take to do this, whether the work uh, amounts to anything or if I can pull off actually doing the eyes and nose and mouth properly, and I think it even requires a beard, remains to be seen. Okay, folks, I just wanted to show you where I am in this. I've cleaned up this much. Here's before and here's after. And I did the most work on these straps here and trying to figure out what the pattern was. I had to go in and draw it and analyze it. If you look at the restored version, this whole part is just missing. So I couldn't paint over it. It's not in this version. So I had to recreate it. Now, some parts I've painted in relatively nicely. I'll do more. And here I've just blocked in the pattern so I know what it is. You can see this eye looks much better. Here's the restored version. And I made the lids meet a little more based on my symmetrical outline here I created before. I just shaded a little to bring it in. I'm not doing heavy correcting at this point. I'm mostly just trying to clean it up. The nose, while it looks better, and I got rid of a lot of the problems, also looks like a hot dog. This line's too straight. I'll have to go in and fix that. Now, I want to show you something which I haven't shared yet, which is the other contenders. There's more than one Salvatore Mundi. This is another one. I call this one the Jim Morrison Salvatore Mundi. It's the, uh, something in this mouth and jaw and nose, not so much the eyes. 
Uh, these curls are ridiculous, but some things here are done fairly well. I could have looked at the pattern in this one, but I didn't. Uh, the fabric coming over is a bit different. You'll see this repeated. Leonardo made a cartoon and other artists used it to produce Salvatore Mundi's. He didn't invent the Salvatore Mundi. This is a standard, should I say it's an icon, a trope, I, I'm not sure, uh, it's image anyways, that artists would make. And that's why it's full on frontal view with the one hand held up and the ball, glass ball, crystal ball, whatever material it is in the other hand. But I want you to notice some things about these. So there's that one, there's the plucked eyebrows one. Some people think this one's the original Leonardo, but those eyebrows, woo! And the eyes are also bizarre. Apparently nobody can do eyes. Eyes are challenging. These are a little better if just a little bit wall-eyed. And then there's our third contender, the completely wall-eyed Henry VIII Salvatore Mundi. But there's something special about this one to notice. The hands. Look at this hand here. It's done from the same cartoon. If you compare that to ours, you can see there's that indication of the same thumb and this shape. But in the restored version, the restorer went for this amorphous, bulbous, non-committal form. So that's not convincing. When I do the hand, I will base it off of this hand. The fingers are more articulated in this. This is especially true in this hand, which really shows the fingers more, shows these wrinkles here. You get that shape here where the fingernail intersects the finger. If you look at our version we're working on, in this cleaned up version, you can't even see the pink. It's just gone. These things have disappeared and the restorer recreated it as if the pinky was supposed to be this little tiny thing and the hand is just this scalloped shape and you have this big giant maw of a, a palm. I always thought looking at this that this area here that is lighter would probably be what the palm really was. And this one, these are all hundreds of years old. This one shows it, it's much more likely. This is the shape of the hand. Now I can only assume if we are going to say that this image was ever done by Leonardo and it just got compromised through being painted over, being damaged, cracked, broken, and then restored and refurbished and essentially recreated, then we can look here and find how to make this hand match the other. There's other things about the different images. Let's see, this one. The eyebrows are wonky, but this one has the most detail in the hair with the most curls. The beard is going off. I am not looking forward to attempting to do a beard, but here's the hairline. You can see striations in the hair, even individual strands. There's a lot more detail. And something I notice is the distance from the top of the head to the hairline is thicker than in our version. Here it's thick and it looks good, but she kind of cropped it down like uh, he just got out of the shower and his hair's all flattened. So when I revise it, I want to keep the top of the head up here, put a part in his hair and put striations in and some strands. Another way I'm going to do this phase of recreating it is using this program Pure Ref so I can have references easy at hand. So I can look at these, <laughs> this is an Albrecht Durer done at the same time, mind you, roughly the same time, and look at the craftsmanship of this and the reflections in the eyes. This is far superior to this. This is a joke in comparison, and we're supposed to believe Leonardo did that. But what I find really interesting, one of the most useful things, is this drawing here. Here we can see how Leonardo treats the nose. Same here, the nose. He uses the same features over and over. The nose is pointy. Here's how he does the nostrils. This bit here, notice the light reflecting up. They have to put that back in. You can see the shape of the cheekbones, this rather strong, a little bit wide chin. This is how he does mouths. Again, you can see the light reflecting up. 
He's a master of shading and the eyelids, how he does them, the gentle curves he likes, the line here, and then the indentation here. If he's going to do a brow, where's it gonna start? Where's it going to end? And notice this conspicuous shape here on the outer brow. You see this in the Mona Lisa. So this is a characteristic of how he draws the human head. There's almost a dimple here. You can get a lot of information here about how to do it. And here's the hair. You might have it curl here, a couple curls, and the curls go in. Useful to know when reproducing the curls. There was another one that's interesting. This one also shows similar features, that same nose, but here you can see a bit how he does the neck, a bit of muscles here. Highlights, indentation, he indicates the throat. You can also see that in this one, where they've attempted to do the throat and the musculature of the neck, where our version has none of that. Now, a question comes to mind, which is, why did art experts, critics, people with tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of disposable income not notice what's wrong with this face? And part of it is just that most art critics and experts are not artists. And stuff that's agonizingly obvious to me, they can't even see it. It's also the reason why people buy fake abstract expressionist paintings. When I look at them, I'm like, that is not a Pollock. That is not a Rothko. That's a horrible fake. And people will buy it for millions of dollars because they're not artists. So let me just show you why I'm so attuned to how to do eyes and noses and stuff. I worked on a series. There's 36 images. They're uh, all based on photographs of me that I used uh, face app to change into different ages and genders and even races though. You're not able to do that. And to do these, I had to recreate from botched versions. So here's a man I produced, and then I ran it through FaceApp, and it created this female version. And somehow, I decided to run with that and try and fix it. I went from this version to this version. Here you can see I invented my own glasses. I was still <laughs> struggling with the eyes. I drew an eye to study my eye, tried to look at the other guy's eyes. Here's a close-up of an eye, trying to figure out how to do eyes, the right shape. Here's a final result. I did get the eyes down pretty well, I think. But there's a lot of practice in these. I've just spent hundreds of hours trying to accurately depict human faces. Now this one, I obviously, okay, it's intentional, but there's some interesting stuff in here. Um, this is what I started with, and this is what I finished with. So I had to recreate eyes here you can see this is half, this is the other half of what I created from the part on the right. There's another one. I created this image from this, I added in the glasses, I articulated the eyes better, I adjusted them. Here you can see I went from this image to this image and made a digital painting. Here's a big difference. Look at the teeth on this. I had to go in and correct because the AI just does all sorts of crazy things. I added the hair in, the close-up of the eye, Still, I struggle, it's not perfect. I am just showing how much I worked at this and studied this, these eyelashes are wrong, and uh, I'm still working on it. It's always a challenge, but what I'm getting at is that because I've been doing this, because I'm an artist, because I've worked at portraits based on botched sources, I am uh, attuned to these kinds of mistakes, which I make which are very difficult to correct. And the art experts have not done that. So they are not used to it. They're not attuned to it. They're like food critics who've never been in the kitchen. And that's also why I started making this channel, is to give you the view of art of an artist. Not just someone who comes at art through theory and ideas and backstory, but someone who also knows how to make images and is engaged in making art and being an artist, it's a different perspective. So I'm gonna end the video here, and in the next video I'm gonna show my recreation of what I think 
Leonardo's Salvatore Mundi would look like. I do fully appreciate that me doing this in Photoshop is infinitely easier than someone trying to mechanically do this with a physical painting. That said, there's also additional difficulties in that I'm not just trying to clean or accentuate what I already see there, even if it's misleading, but I'm studying Leonardo's drawings. I'm comparing different versions of the Salvatore Mundi, and I'm bringing out that information to realize the form rather than just looking at what's left of what's there and embellishing it. Here's a song that was beautiful when performed by my ancestor Art. Are you going? 